How do we respond in that moment when we feel we tried God and sensed his move, but now we are right back deep in the problem trying to battle it with little or no strength? From the life of King Jehoshaphat and David, we get insights on strengthening ourselves in the Lord to be well prepared to face trials and problems. Please turn with me in your Bibles to 2 Chronicles chapter 20. 2 Chronicles chapter 20. This chapter records for us an incident in the life of King Jehoshaphat, the fourth king of Judah. He was considered to be one of the good kings of Judah. In the chapters preceding chapter 20, that is in chapter 17, we read that the Lord was with Jehoshaphat because Jehoshaphat sought the Lord like his father, David. He did not seek Baal, but he sought the Lord, the God of his father. And he walked in his commandments. And, and unlike the other bad, so-called bad kings of Israel and Judah. In that same chapter, verse 6, it's recorded for us that Jehoshaphat took delight in the ways of the Lord and he removed all the high places and the idols and the altars of Baal and the other idols in Judah. Verse 12 and 13 of the same chapter records for us that Jehoshaphat became increasingly powerful. He built fortresses and he had many men of war and mighty men of valor. In 2 Chronicles chapter 19, we read that in the third year of King Jehoshaphat's reign, he sent his leaders, Levites, and priests with the book of the law to teach the people. And Jehoshaphat, King Jehoshaphat himself, went from Bathsheba, Bathsheba to the mountains of Ephraim and brought back the people back to the ways of the Lord. He brought them back to the Lord, the God of their fathers. And then we read in the same chapter, in chapter 19, that he set judges and priests and Levites and commanded them saying that they shall act in the fear of the Lord and be faithful and loyal in their heart as they serve God. Now coming to chapter 20, verse 1. We read that the Moabites, the Ammonites, and the Meonites come to wage war against King Jehoshaphat. So three large armies come to fight King Jehoshaphat, come against the, the, the nation of Judah. The verse 1 begins with these words. It happened after this. After what? Jehoshaphat, as I just told you and I just mentioned to you, had instituted a number of reforms of bringing back the nation or the people of Judah back to the Lord, the God of their fathers. It could have been easy for Jehoshaphat to tell God, God, I tried to bring this nation back to you. I taught them to put away their idols and to seek you because you alone are God. And here am I facing three large armies who threaten to wipe us out. This is not fair, God. This is not what I expect from you after I've been faithful and I've done what you wanted me to do. Often people respond this way. When they try to follow God and they get hit with a trouble or a problem or a difficulty, they say, God, this isn't fair. I've tried to follow you. I've been good. I've tried to keep all your commands. And now I'm here hit by this, this problem, this trouble, this difficult situation that stares me in my face. Or we can tell God that I've not hurt anybody. I've not done anything wrong. Then why has God given me this problem? Or why are we going through this? Or sometimes we ask, what sin have I committed that I'm facing this situation or this problem in my life? And often people respond in such situations by getting angry with God. They blame God. They pity themselves. 
they feel sad for themselves. Did Jehoshaphat respond the same way? Another natural reaction for Jehoshaphat could have been to trust in his army. Like I just mentioned to you, that he had built strong fortresses and he had mighty men of war and strong men of valor. And he could have just said, yeah, I'm prepared for this battle. I'm prepared to face these three kings, these three large armies. Let's fight them. But what was Jehoshaphat's response? Let's look at 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 3. It says that Jehoshaphat was afraid, he feared, but he set himself to seek the Lord. In this situation where three armies were facing him and he had to face them, Jehoshaphat was filled with fear, but he set himself to seek the Lord. He resisted the temptation of panicking, of getting angry with God, or blaming him, or trusting in his, in his strong army. Yes, he was frightened at the situation that he was facing, but he sought God's presence. Well, this is nothing new for Jehoshaphat, as I just mentioned to you, that he sought the Lord, his God, and he walked in his commandments. Jehoshaphat declared a fast throughout all Judah. He told all the people of Judah, children, women, men, and even animals to fast and pray. And he asked them all to come to the temple at Jerusalem. And the word of God tells us that all the people of Judah came to the temple to seek help from the Lord. Not just to seek help from the Lord, but to seek the Lord. They just did not come to seek help from the Lord, but they came to seek the Lord. The Hebrew word for seek means literally to trample underfoot. It means to trample underfoot, to beat a path to God because you frequented that way so often. And for Jehoshaphat, this was nothing new because he was constantly a king who was seeking the Lord. No, Jehoshaphat could have cried out to God for help and then rallied all his, his, his mighty men of war and strategized a war plan. See, like, like, some, like what we would do when we face a difficult situation or a problem or a difficulty. We would just go to God and tell him our problem and then we will run and find ways and solutions and people to fix it. But Jehoshaphat just waited on the Lord in the temple. He knew that time was precious for him. He knew that instead of spending time seeking, the Lord, seeking the Lord at the temple, he could strategize his war plans. But Jehoshaphat and all the people of Judah and Jerusalem fasted and they prayed. Imagine... At this time of crisis, if they fast and pray, what physical and mental strength they would have to fight the armies. But by fasting and praying, they showed immense trust in God. They trusted that God would provide them the strength that they need to face the situation, to face this battle, to fight the enemy. Jehoshaphat did not depend on his physical strength, but he depended on the strength of the Lord. Now we must ask ourselves, are we looking to God to strengthen us only when we come to a church service on a Sunday morning? Or at life group? Or at a prayer meeting that we attend? Do we look up to men and women to pray for us so that we can be strengthened? Well, these are all natural ways that one would respond when we face situations, when we face difficulties, when we go through struggles, when we face trials. Or 
Are we so used to living in the presence of the Lord that we constantly and continually derive our strength, our hope, and our encouragement from Him when we fight our battles? I'm not saying that corporate worship is not important. I'm not saying that we, we shouldn't look up to our life group and to our, our prayer groups to strengthen us in times of need. Neither am I saying that we shouldn't go to any man or woman to pray for us in our time of need. However, often these become our center of focus. And we seek these things rather than seeking God. Rather than just staying in his presence and laying everything bare before him and just seeking him for who he is and what he can do in our situations and what answer he can provide for us. When we continue live, continually live in, in God's presence, we find ourselves praying even when we don't feel like praying. We find ourselves worshipping him and praising him and thanking him even when the situation does not require of us to do so. And we, we find ourselves trusting God even when we see that everything around or our situation looks hopeless. It's in his presence that we continually live and we find strength and encouragement and hope, strength to fight our battles, persevere, experience joy and peace in the midst of the storm and not just barely managing to get battered, to just get past battered and feeling the weightiness. Living in his presence means to lay everything aside and just seek God and just seek him for who he is and what he can do. Susanna Wesley was married to a preacher in the late 1600s. She was married uh, to Sam, who was a preacher. They had 10 children, actually 19, nine of them who died in their infancy. And two of them, who we know as John and Charles Wesley, who brought tens of thousands of people to the Lord. It sounds like a sweet story, isn't it? But we see that Sam, Susanna Wesley's husband, was very poor at managing his finances well. And they as a couple disagreed on everything, from finances to politics. And often, Sam would leave Susanna to take care of the house and the children all by herself for long periods of time sometimes over something as simple as an argument. One of their children was unable to walk. One couldn't talk till the age of six. Susanna herself was desperately sick most of her life. Their home burned to the ground twice and they lost everything in their ashes. And one of their daughters became pregnant out of wedlock. They had no money for food or their basic necessities. And Sam even went to debtor's prison. Long before Susanna had an inkling to how her married life was, when she was young, she made God this promise. She told God that for every one hour or every hour she spent in entertainment, she would spend the same amount of time in reading the word and praying. So this was her promise to God, that every hour she would spend in entertainment, the same amount of time she would spend in reading the word and praying. But taking care of the house and raising so many kids when Sam had, was, had all, all, always disappeared was had made this commitment and this promise to keep very difficult for Susanna. And I'm sure we can understand if she does not keep this promise, right? But she didn't. Instead, she would spend two hours a day praying in the presence of the Lord, reading the word and praying. Imagine two hours a day 
with 10 children in the house, where would she find a quiet place? So she told her children that every time her apron was over her head, she was in prayer and they, should, they shouldn't disturb her. Susanna was devoted to her walk in Christ to pray for her children and to grow in the knowledge in the word and time with God. This dedicated woman's story would have been only known to God and to her children if it was not for her two sons, John and Charles Wesley. They said that their mother was the greatest example that inspired both of them. They both said that their mom influenced them more than any other person in the world. And we know that John and Charles Wesley became powerhouses for the glory of God. John preached to nearly half a million people in the 1700s. And everywhere they went and preached God's word and they traveled, there was a revival. And they taught God's word. And Charles Wesley wrote over 9,000 hymns, some of which we even sing today. In the middle of these great hardships, Susanna constantly tapped into her source of strength. She consciously and intentionally connected with the Lord every day. When you dwell in the presence of the Lord, he extends all of himself to us. And all of God's immeasurable power and strength is made available to us. But to the extent you extend yourself to God is the extent he extends himself to us. I'll say that again. To the extent you extend yourself to God is the extent he extends himself to us. When Jehoshaphat and the people of Judah extended all of themselves to God, God and they sought the Lord, the, God, the Lord God answered them. We see in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 15 to 17, the Spirit of the Lord came on the prophet Jezeel, and God gives Jehoshaphat and this, the people a very encouraging message. He says, do not be afraid, do not be dismayed because of this great multitude. For the battle is not yours, but the battle is God's. And then he tells them what they need to do when they go to the battle the next day. And God tells them, you need not fight. All you need to do is just stand still. Just stand your ground. Just stand still. Position yourself and you will see the salvation. And you will see the deliverance of God. And he tells them, do not be afraid. Do not fear. Do not be dismayed. For the battle is not yours, but God's. So the next day, early in the morning, Jehoshaphat leads his army in the way that God advised him or told him to do so. And when I read this passage, it was, it was quite funny. It was, uh, it was quite hilarious because, you know, when a, when a king uh, leads his army to war, who does he put in the front? Who does he put in the front? The generals, yes, the strong men, uh, the men of uh, valor. He puts them right up in front, right? But we see Jehoshaphat was somebody who so enjoyed God's presence, who, who just, just sought God so much that in, in, in the front of the, the battle line, leading the people were the Korites and the Kothites. Now these Korites and Kothites are temple singers and musicians who lead the worship in the temple. And so he put them in the front and he appointed them and they started singing, give thanks to the Lord for he is good, his love endures for ever. Or the NKJV version says, praise the Lord for his mercy endures forever. Can you imagine? I mean, this king was, is just so filled with the presence of God, just so enjoying praise and worship that he puts these, these people in the front and they're singing and they're worshiping God. I don't know what the soldiers would have thought of King Jehoshaphat. Maybe he lost his mind or what, or maybe he's, he's so tensed with the battle that uh, he does not know what he's doing. See? 
But it's amazing to see that, that this king was praising God even before he saw his victory. He was praising God even before he saw his victory. In verse 22, we see that, you know, the, the people began to sing and praise God. And when they began to sing and praise God, in verse 21 to 23 says, Now when they began to sing and praise the Lord, God set an ambush. It's when God sees their attitude, it's then he acts on their behalf. It says that when God saw them singing and praising, then he sets an ambush. He actually, you know, causes confusion among these three kings. And all these three kings' armies start fighting within themselves and they kill each other. And when Jehoshaphat and his army go and they're standing there, they see in the valley all dead people lying there. But it's interesting that when God sees their attitude, he works on their behalf. God saw their trust and their faith that he had in him. They saw that this, this, this king and this, this people are praising him for their victory even before they saw their victory. And that Jehoshaphat was going forth for battle, putting God ahead of him, not trusting in his army, not trusting in his strategies, not trusting in the, in the prophecy, in the word that God gave him, but he's putting God right ahead in front of him. And that's when God works on their behalf. It's when we dwell in his presence that our focus shifts from the magnitude of our problem to the magnitude or the greatness of our God. See, when we are in the presence of the Lord, our focus shifts from the magnitude of our problem or the greatness of our problem to the magnitude or the greatness of our God. Our focus shifts from being overwhelmed by the problem to be overwhelmed by the greatness and the goodness of our God. So much so that instead of complaining and whining and being vexed by our problem, we're actually singing and praising and thanking God. It's here in this presence that the battle is already won. It's in that presence that the spiritual, in the spiritual realm, the battle is already won. We just need to wait to see the answer in the physical realm. The secret of strengthening ourselves constantly and continually when we face trials and problems and difficulties is to every day continually and constantly spend time in the presence of the Lord. Rejoicing, prayer, thanksgiving, and worship are our tools for strengthening ourselves in the Lord. This is something that is, should be going, ongoing in our lives and not merely that we, what we do when we face crisis or when we face difficulties. Another way of strengthening ourselves in the Lord is to know the Lord we seek. The first thing the way we strengthen ourselves in the Lord is to constantly and continually be in his presence. The second one is to know the Lord we seek, is to know the Lord in whose presence we are spending time. As King Jehoshaphat and the people of Judah stood up in the assembly right in front of the temple in the house of the Lord, Jehoshaphat prays aloud. He does not begin by pouring out his problem and saying, God, you know, we have these three great armies. What do we do? We just don't know what to do. You know, we are facing a threat. They're, they're going to wipe us out. We are your people. Do something. What do we do, God? He just does not come to the temple and he just does not pour out his problems to God. But he has an, you know, amazing prayer that he prays. In verse 6, he begins his prayer by reciting God's relationship with them. He tells, he says that, O oh Lord, God of our fathers. Jehoshaphat reminds himself and the people that the God who is going to fight their battle is the God of their fathers, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. 
The same God who was with them, who helped them, is the same God who is with them now in the situation and is going to help them. Next, he recites God's attributes. He says, are you not the God of heaven? Don't you rule over all the nations and the kingdoms of the world? In your hand, there is power and might so that no one can stand against you or withstand you. Now, why is he telling God all this? Certainly, it's not for God's information, right? But it's just to rehearse in his mind and in the minds of his people who is the Lord, the God they are putting their trust in and how great he is. Next, Jehoshaphat in his prayer recites God's actions. In verse 7 of the same chapter, he says, Are you not the God who drove out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel? So he's telling God, God, you are the, you are the God who drove out all the people from Canaan and gave us this land of Israel. Because this is a covenant that you made with your descendant Abraham, your friend forever. Just look at his words. Look at what, how he's reminding God. He not only reminds God of the covenant that he made with Abraham, but he also reminds God of the covenant that he made with King Solomon when the temple was dedicated. Now, when King Solomon dedicated the temple, God made a covenant with his people. He said, every time you face a disaster, whether it is a sword or a judgment or a pestilence, when you stand before me in this temple and when you cry out to me, I will listen to your affliction. I will hear and I will save you. So here we see that Jehoshaphat is reminding God of the covenant that he made with the first person, Abraham, yes. And the second one, with Solomon and the people of Israel, that he will hear them and save them when they are afflicted and they are going through problems. Finally, Jehoshaphat mentions the problem which he reminds God stems from the fact that Israel had obeyed God when these same three groups, the, the Moabites, the Ammonites, and the Muonites, came to wage war against them, God asked the Israelites when they were traveling from Egypt to the promised land to leave them, not to destroy them. So Joseph had to say, God, remember, you asked us to do this, and we obeyed you, we spared them. And now these very same people are looking to drive us out of the land that you gave us as our possession. So he's saying not of our land or our possession, but the land that you gave us as our possession. So he's saying, God, this is your possession. And they're trying to take it away from us. And finally, he calls God's attention. He calls attention, to, sorry, he calls attention to God's ability to deal with the problem and Israel's inability to handle the situation. And he says, God, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. After saying everything and praising God about his greatness, about who he is, his actions, reminding, him, reminding themselves of his relationship and the covenant, now Jehoshaphat says, God, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. Jehoshaphat's prayer focuses on God as he revealed himself in his word. If we fill our prayers with the greatness of our problems, our faith will shrink. I'll repeat that again. If we fill our prayer with the greatness of our problems, our faith will shrink. But if we fill our prayers with the greatness and the power of our God, our faith will rise up. If we fill our prayers with the greatness of who God is, of what he has done in, the, in history, what he has done in our lives, our faith will grow. And God actually enjoys 
God actually delights in such a prayer, in such believing prayers, where we put our finger on his promise, where we put our finger on his word, where we put our finger on the truth of his word and say, God, this is what I'm believing for my case as well. Make it so. In the midst of our trials and problems, God wants us to focus on who he is, on his greatness, his power, his might, and what, we, what he can do for us. In the midst of our situations where we face difficulties and problems and challenges, God wants us to be reminded of who we are in Christ, of our identity in Christ. He wants us to remind ourselves of the covenant that he made. The new covenant far exceeds and is far greater than the old covenant. So every time you go through problems, difficulties, situations, you think you feel you're hopeless, good for nothing, you're a failure, nothing good is happening in your life, just remind yourself of who you are in God. And when you see your situations are not going the way it should, you're pressing in, you're fighting in, and your battle is raging, the storm is high, just remind yourself of the covenant blessing that is yours as a son and daughter of Jesus Christ. We're just going to pause for a moment now. I don't know what situation you are in, how you came to church this morning. Whether the doctor told you this last week that your health is deteriorating, or you have this sickness, or the scan does not look good, or you're facing challenges at your workplace, you're troubled and concerned about your children who are going astray, who are lost. Or you're just feeling depressed and hopeless. This morning we are going to stand and make our declaration. Because APC's declaration is a declaration where it speaks about our identity in God who we are in Christ. It also lists out the covenant blessing. So even as we stand up and declare it all together, we will read it all out together. I just want you to believe by faith. To say, God, this is my situation. This is where I am now. I just don't know what to do, but my eyes are on you. And I'm just declaring and decreeing your word. I'm just declaring and decreeing your promises. I'm just declaring and decreeing the truth that is established in your word over my situation. And this, these are the blessings of the new covenant. And as your son and as your daughter, and I, I am entitled to these covenant blessings. Let's just declare it and believe God for who he is and what he can do. Let's just all rise up. Let's just close our eyes. Just take a minute to close your eyes. And even as you do, just tell God. He knows where you are. But just tell him, what are you feeling this morning? What are your anxieties? What is bothering you? What are your dis disappointments, your frustrations, your anxiety? If you've lost your sense of identity, if you feel that you are hopeless, useless, that you can't do anything right, that you are a failure, these are all lies of the enemy. Let's just declare and decree together what God thinks of us, who we are in Christ, and what is our covenant blessings. Let's raise up our Bibles and say the declaration together. This is God's word. This is God speaking to me. 
I am who God says I am. I can do what God says I can do. I will become everything God has promised. I'm saved, healed, delivered, redeemed. I'm blessed, victorious, prosperous, triumphant. I'm a minister of God, a servant of Christ, and a channel of his blessing to many people. I receive his word, believe his word, and live by his word. Christ is my master, and to him I am in absolute surrender. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. Please don't think that this was an introduction to the declaration. This is part of my sermon. So don't think, oh, she has a long sermon yet to preach and we're going to be here all day. No, no. Well, this is part one of the sermon, but we're just going to continue with uh, what we have been looking at. You know, when David faced uh, Goliath, he was very confident, right? And where do you think his confidence came from? Where do you think his confidence came from? From the Lord? Okay, what else? Sorry? Knowing the Lord is God? What else? The past victory, yes. You know, he was able to face Goliath with determination and courage and confidence and with strength because, first of all, he knew the Lord is God. But secondly, because of his past victories, which enabled him and strengthened him to put his confidence and to fight Goliath. He must have thought and said to himself, when, I, when God enabled me to kill a lion and a bear, what is this man? Why can't he give me victory over him? David knew that he had a great, big, wonderful God. It was not just a fact for David, but a reality in his life. You know that song we used to sing in... in um, in, in, in Sunday school, I have a great, big, wonderful God. Yes? David knew that he had a great, big, wonderful God, but that was not just a fact, but a reality in his life. For David, having a great, big, wonderful God was also not just a fact, but something that he experienced. David became king only after 10 or 13 years after Saul anointed him as king. So it was 10 or 13 years back that Saul anointed him as a young lad and now he had to wait for more than 10 or 13 years and he was not yet crowned as king. In those interim periods or those interim years, David faced a lot of persecution, difficulties, struggles, challenges, he was constantly running for his life from King Saul. Because King Saul was determined to kill David. And we see that David left Jerusalem and he went and settled in various places, but somehow King Saul would know his hideout and come after him and David would again have to run. And during this time, David liberates the city of Kilia from the Philistines. And I'm sure you'd have been happy that, you know, he delivered his people and here are his own people that he can stay with in the city. But that was too short-lived because David heard that Saul had come to know that he was in Kilia and he was coming to capture him. So David seeks the Lord and he asks God, God, is Saul coming to Kilia to capture me? Will the people of Kilia save me, protect me, or will they deliver me into the hands of Saul? And David received a very sad answer from God. God said, Saul, David, Saul is coming to capture you. And the people of Kilia 
are going to hand you over to King Saul. Just imagine how David would have felt. He put his life on the line and he saved his very own people. And here are these people, instead of protecting David and saving him from King Saul, are going to give him into the hands of King Saul. David was dejected and saddened. And then he flees to the wilderness with his men. And these when men were the rejects, the so-called rejects of society that David takes and he trains them for battle and he makes them strong warriors. And we see that Saul, King Saul, was constantly running to capture David. And David was so fed up. Imagine 10 years. And finally he decided to go to Gath, which is a city of Goliath, and, and live there under the protection of the king of Gath. And then he thought, at least there, Saul, because it's the Philistine territory, Saul will not come to capture him. So when he goes there, the, 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 the Philistine king of Gath welcomes David and he gives him and his 600 men, these rejects, so-called rejects of society, he gives them the city of Ziklag to live in. And Saul stopped pursuing David. And David wins the confidence of the king of Gath and he makes him his personal bodyguard. Now after a few years, the Philistines decide to wage war against King Saul. So the king of Gath asked David to support him and his, and his armies to fight against King Saul. So David takes his 600 men and they go to fight King Saul. But when the other so-called four lords or the four Philistine princes, princess, prince, sorry, see David and his soldiers, they tell the king of God that we will not take David and his soldiers along with him, us because they can change sides in the battle. What if he supports King Saul? What if he fights against us so that he can win Saul's approval, so that he can go back to Israel, so that he can become king? What will happen of us? We will lose the battle. And they forced the king of God to send David back to Ziklag. So the king of God tells David that he has to leave and he has to go to Ziklag. And David is heartbroken. He's saddened. He's depressed. But he has to go back. So he and his men, they march and they go back to Ziklag. And when they arrive at Ziklag, they are heartbroken to see that the entire city was burnt, everything that they had destroyed, and their wives and children and all their possession taken away by the Amalekites. So when they were not in Ziklag, the Amalekites came and fought, uh, uh, came and attacked Ziklag and burned the entire city and they took away all David's possessions and all of these men's wives and their children and they left. And when they came and David and his men, when they came and saw this, they were heartbroken and they started weeping till they had no more power to weep. That's what it says in, in, in 1 Samuel chapter 30 verse 6. Sorry, in verse 5. They wept so loud that they had no more power to weep. Now, how did David's men respond to the situation? In 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 6, we read, Now David was greatly distressed, for the people spoke of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and daughters. All of these 600 men, the so-called rejects of society, who David trained as warriors, when they see that the city is burned, their sons and daughters and their wives taken away, everything that they have lost, they decided to stone David. 
Now, how did David respond? The latter part of verse 6 tells us an amazing thing that David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. In this situation, David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. It does not say David prayed and said, Oh Lord, please strengthen me. Please give me the strength to face the situation. But it says he sought the Lord. He sought the presence of the Lord. He strengthened himself in the Lord. See, David faced one rejection after the other. And most of them was most difficult and painful for him. But he turns to the Lord his God for his strength. Because he knows in the past that it was his God who strengthened him all the time. And where did this, this, this thing come of, you know, just, just going and, uh, and strengthening himself in the presence of the Lord? It came because when he was young in the wilderness for many days, far from his home, far from his family, just with the sheep, David would spend time talking to God. David would spend time worshiping God. David would spend time in the presence of the a presence of God, and there was nothing new for him when he was press, facing this challenge to seek the Lord his God, to be strengthened in his presence. David knew that the source of his strength was outside of himself, and that was in his God, so he ran to him. He knew that while he was the weakest and was unable to fight in his own strength, he could be strong in the Lord his God and in the strength of his might. He sought his presence first, and God strengthened David. God gave him the answer. When you are in the presence of God, that's where your answer comes from. That's where you receive your help. That's where you know what you need to do. And God tells him, pursue the Amalekites, and I will help you. You will win the battle. You will get back everything that you have lost, and I will strengthen you. Surely you will recover everything. Not too long after this, David becomes the king of Israel. Now, when we look into the Bible, we see there are numerous promises of God that talks about strength. You know, every morning, I find it very difficult to wake up in the morning to face a day because I have various health issues and concerns, and I'm constantly speaking words or Verses from the Bible that talk about strength. See? The Lord is the strength of my life. The Lord strengthens me with his righteous right hand. The Lord is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Those who look to the Lord, the Lord will strengthen them. So I'm constantly, you know, even as I can't wake up in the morning, I find it very difficult. I don't think I'll be able to face the day. I'm constantly speaking words of strength, verses from the Bible that talk about strength. So you might be telling me this morning, when God promises to strengthen us, then why should we strengthen ourselves in the Lord? Right? That's a question that might be running in some of your minds. Well, God promises to strengthen us. There are numerous verses that he promises to strengthen us. Then why should we strengthen ourselves in the Lord? We'll just look at three things and we'll close. The first thing is so that God can be glorified. So that God can be glorified. When we turn to the world for help, who receives the glory? The world. But when we turn to God for help, who receives the glory? The Lord our God receives the glory. It's recorded in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 27 and 29, that when they returned from the battle, Jehoshaphat and his army and all the people of Judah and Jerusalem, with Jehoshaphat in front of them, to go back to Jerusalem with joy for the Lord, had made them rejoice over their enemies. So they came back to Jerusalem again, worshipping with stringed instruments and harps and trumpets to the house of the Lord. See, they don't go back and feast and party but they go back to the house of the Lord to give him thanks for the victory that 
that they didn't have to fight for, but they just had to stand and see. And it says that the fear of God was upon all the kingdoms of those countries when they heard that the Lord had fought against the enemies of Israel. So not only did God receive glory with the people of Judah, because as I, as I said in the beginning, that the people of Judah and Israel were actually running behind the idols, behind Baal, who was not a god. See, and when they saw God fight the battle for them, and their victory was so easy, and they received, you know, a booty of possessions from all these three armies, you know, God received the glory and praise. He was lifted up again in the lives of the people of Israel. Not only in the people of the, not only did he receive glory in the life of the, of the people of Judah and Jerusalem, but also in the nations surrounding them when they heard about this victory. They were filled with fear. Actually, they were filled with reverence and awe for the Lord, the God of Israel. It wasn't, it wasn't David's desire to become king. He was chosen as king and anointed as king. Then why do you think that he had to go through all these difficulties in his life for more than 10 to 13 years? Why this pain, suffering, and distress? Because God did not want another King Saul in King David. Because God did not want another King Saul in King David. You know, Saul was the first king of Israel. His heart was not groomed through testing before he became king. So when he, you know, had a measure of anointing to shepherd the people and lead them against the enemies, and he won those wars because the Lord God gave him the victory, it exposed Saul's weaknesses, the weaknesses of his heart towards God. That weakness combined with a growing appetite for a glory for himself and the favor of man led him down into destruction. And he did not bring glory to God, but tried to bring glory to himself and brought dishonor and disobeyed the Lord. So Saul's heart was more inclined to make him more successful and this ultimately destroyed him. But we see that David, though he was a man after God's own heart, these years of testing and hardship groomed him to handle the anointing, groomed him to handle the responsibility, and groomed him to handle the glory that God gave him. Otherwise, like King Saul, David too would have wasted his anointing that he had received. Secondly, trials and problems make us mature believers who think and act like Jesus. James 1.4 says, Consider it joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. When we face trials and difficulties and problems, when our focus is fixed on Jesus, the author and the perfecter and the finisher of our race, we become like the one we are looking at. And his life, his nature starts flowing in our lives and transforms us into his likeness. So that is why we need to strengthen ourselves in the Lord. The last thing, the third one, is so that we can be mature believers who use the favor of God not for our purposes, but for his purposes. So that we can be mature believers who use the favor of God that he gives us, his favor that he gives us for his purposes and not for ours. This morning, where are you looking for strength to fight your battles, to face your challenges? to face your sickness and your difficulties? Are you looking to just corporate worship times or prayer meetings or people to pray for you? 
Or are you looking to strengthen yourself in the presence of the Lord constantly, continually, every day? And when you are faced with these problems, do you know the Lord, the God you are seeking and whose presence you are calling upon? And just be assured that even as you are strengthening yourself in the Lord, that His glory will be revealed in a greater measure, in a greater way in your life. And you will become mature and you will be able to handle, handle the anointing and the favor that He bestows upon your life. Let's just close our eyes. This morning, if any one of us here do not know the Lord, the God whom Jehoshaphat knew and tasted and experienced, if any of you do not know and have a relationship that David had with this God, that Abraham had with this God, this morning, you can have this relationship with this God who loves you, who gave his very life for you, who's constantly with you, who constantly assures to strengthen you. So if you want to give your life to Jesus this morning, if you want to have a relationship with this God who fights your battles, who strengthens you, who loves you, who hears you, who answers you. You can have this relationship with him. All you need to do is just say the simple prayer. All you need to do is just believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins. That he took your punishment on that cross. He died in your place so that you can experience life in abundance, life in fullness. So that you can enjoy all of him and all of his fullness that he extends to you. If you want to do that this morning, you can just repeat this prayer after me. Father, we thank you for giving us your only son who made that full, sufficient, perfect sacrifice on the cross for my sins. Jesus, I thank you for dying on that cross, for taking upon my sin, my shame, my guilt, my pain, my sickness, so that I can be free from every curse, every bondage, from every pain, every suffering. Jesus, I believe you are God. I accept you as my Lord and Savior. Please forgive my sins. Come into my life and reign over me. Be Lord over my life. I thank you, Lord Jesus, for hearing my prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And for those of us who are battling and fighting our battles with little or no strength, maybe some of us have given up. Maybe some of us have let our battles overtake us. And we are living in constant pain and frustration and bitterness and disappointment. This morning, tell the Lord, Lord, I choose to strengthen myself in you. God, I choose to seek and to live constantly and continually in your presence, God. I choose, God, to believe in this great God who has the power 
who gives me the strength, who's made his covenant with me, that I will be an overcomer, that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Just make this commitment this morning, this afternoon. Say, God, I will just make this commitment this morning to constantly and continually live and dwell in your presence. Because where your presence is, there's freedom, there's liberty, there's joy, there's peace that I can face even in the midst of the storm. We thank you, God, for your word. We thank you for the way that you worked in the lives of King Jehoshaphat and King David, God. Help it to strengthen us this morning, God. To strengthen us in our faith walk, in our faith journey, to fight our battles with you, God. We thank you that you're a God who will strengthen us, God. Help us to be people who desire to, to live in your presence, God. People who desire, God, to, to manifest your glory of who you are and what you can do. We thank you for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We trust that this message was a blessing to you. We would love to hear from you. You can email us at contact at apcwo.org. Also visit our website apcwo.org for additional resources. Thank you for listening and God bless you.